With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Full work limited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Twitter has become kind of the de facto town square. Really important that people have the both the uh, the reality and the perception that they are able to speak freely within the bounds of the law. My strong intuitive sense is that uh, having a public platform that is maximally trusted and broadly inclusive is extremely important to the future of civilization. You are listening to the Billy D's podcast. All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Billy D's podcast. I am absolutely thrilled that you are here. As always, if you have never checked out our program before, we are primarily an interview and a commentary podcast. You can find the Billy D's podcast pretty much anywhere. Podcasts are found, including all the big ones, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all those, and also now on Good Pods. Our friends over at Good Pods, very similar to like Good Reads, very supportive to independent creators. So do check them out. This will be a commentary podcast today. This is kind of what we call our bonus unconfidential. And we cover a couple of different topics and we kind of glaze on them kind of lightly. And uh, today we're going to talk about Elon Musk and uh, Twitter. And I'm also going to follow up. On last week's episode about the Ukraine, I got to tell you, tons of listens on that episode. So I do want to follow up with a few things. Before I get into all that, I heard a piece of trivia. Have you ever stumbled upon a piece of information or trivia or what have you? And it it just like blows you away. You are like, I never knew that. And you're like, well, I got to share this with people. (laughs) This happened to me the other day, and I got to tell you, I I never made the connection. But the Greek word hystera means uterus, okay? And this is where the term hysterectomy comes from. Well, interesting, there was a time, and, and this concept actually goes back thousands of years to the Egyptians, who felt that feelings of anxiety, depression, and just, you know, general unhappiness in women was attributable to something called the spontaneous uterus movement or the wandering womb. And there was a number of different things that they tried to do to cure this. Uh, But what's interesting is this is where... From the the Greek word hystera, which means uterus, and the idea that it's moving around and causing madness in women, shall we say, that is where the term hysteria comes from. And I got to tell you, that just blows me away. So the next time, you know, you're talking to someone of the uh, female uh, persuasion and you say to that person, hey, listen, you're being hysterical. That's probably maybe just a little bit sexist. So maybe you might want to ch- change it up a little bit. But I found that to be very interesting. It's amazing how so many words have these long origins and, uh, you know, go back to things that were clearly, you know, not correct. But this idea 
of this uterus that was moving around inside of a woman's body and causing madness, shall we say. This, this was a concept that was around a long time, centuries. And as a matter of fact, it wasn't until like the 16th century when we became more advanced, of course, and we started accusing women of being witches. So say what you will, but progress eventually comes around. All right. As I before mentioned, uh, we had a fair amount of listens on last week's episode about the situation in the Ukraine. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is that, interestingly, uh, a lot of listens came from the Russian Federation. So I wanted to take a moment and just mention that very rarely when we analyze world events, do we blame the citizenry of any given country for the actions of their of their leaders. Now, I'm a firm believer in that for most people around the world, we, we, we just want to get through the day. You know, we want to get through work, pay our bills, take care of our families, enjoy life a little bit, you know, a little laughter, a little song, and that's pretty much the extent of it. I don't know that individuals for the most part are really that caught up in taking over a certain territory or world domination or any of those other types of things. Those are usually done by, by older leaders. And as it is often said, it's these older men who are always sending in younger people to do all the feeding of the glory of battle and conquest and all these other things. And, you know, it's interesting. Here's another word origin for you. Because of the fact that the young are so pliable and they often don't have a lot of resources and they don't have horses. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is that's where the term infantry came from. Our youngest, our most pure, the ones with the, that don't have a lot, they're the ones who are sent into these situations. And that's a, you know, that's a sad commentary, but unfortunately it is very true. One of the wide points of last week's episode about the Ukraine was that we can't allow leaders around the country, despots or what have you, to do anything they want simply because they have nuclear weapons. Now, I would direct you back to the previous episode. I don't want to go through the whole thing again, but in simple terms, in a nutshell, there has to be a strategy for dealing with these types of individuals other than just letting them do what they want. And I understand the idea of, of, of a nuclear uh, exchange is terrifying. And it's becoming more and more common with different leaders around the world. And we could take this a step further and say that a lot of these uh, tyrannical leaders have uh, terrorist organization underpinnings that are very hard to defend against as well. And it's a terrifying aspect to our world. But the solution has to be something better than, well, if it's genocide or something else, we simply are just going to you know, have to do the best we can, shake our finger at them. Because they're a nuclear power and we certainly don't want to go there. There has to be a, a better way of, of managing these situations than doing that. And that was kind of the, the wider point of the, of the podcast last week. Now, with that being said, I, I had some uh, comments directed uh, towards the show and I also reached out for some opinions and uh, during the last week's episode as well, I was also a, a little bit critical of the far right, not all of the right, not all conservatives, and not even all of the far right, but a number of very vocal and influential far right commentators and, and public f figures have been kind of soft stepping uh, around this idea of Putin and what he's doing and how we've been handling it. So I, I, I kind of checked into that a little bit. And it seems like a lot of the commentators that I, I'm not saying they're defending Russia per se, but they're, they're giving it, they're, they're very tepid on being too critical of Russia at the very least. 
And a lot of this stems from the fact that they point out that over the last number of decades, the United States has played a significant role in manipulating a lot of the regions that are under the guise of Russia and their control and a lot of the regions that are very important to them. And, you know, that's that's largely very true. I, I understand that. The one thing the United States seems to be very vulnerable at doing, the one mistake that we seem to repeat very often is we have a tendency to create these Frankensteins. OK, and the Frankenstein gets up and it extends its hands ready to strangle and it's walking along. And all of a sudden it starts turning around and coming right back at us. And that is something that you have to be very careful about when you're constantly manipulating, um, let's say, whether it's leaders or uh, the politics inside of a nation and the intelligence thereof. But here's the thing. This is part of a game that both the United States and Russia have played at earnest. This isn't something that's been one sided. And if you listen to some of these commentaries and the litany of events in, in the wake of World War II, there's a lot of truth into how these a lot of these lands separated people who had the same homeland regarding Russia and and other places. And, and this has caused friction in those territories ever since. There's a lot of truth to that. My only answer to that would be I will never understand in the wake of World War II why we were so generous with giving the what would become the USSR pretty much the entirety of, of Eastern Europe. That's something that I've never really understood. You know, that would would have been like the United States at the time liberating France from Germany and then just staying there. (laughs) France is now a territory of the United States. Uh, But for some reason, Russia got a pass on Poland and, and so many of those other countries in that in that cluster there. So. My answer to that would be they still weren't satisfied. And a lot of what happened with the fall of the Soviet Union, quite frankly, was their own doing. We certainly didn't help them any with all the political pressure and everything we we put on them. That is true. But it was just a a mismanagement of their resources. It was a mismanagement of their economy. They, They couldn't sustain what they had created. And uh, in the 1980s, when when the wall came down and they started relinquishing a lot of that territory that they they held since World War II, I believe there was an opportunity for both the West and Russia to begin uh, a new type of relationship. And a lot of that's our fault. Uh, A lot of these commentators uh, point out that NATO shouldn't have been encouraged as much as it was to exist and grow during the 1990s when supposedly if you you were going to give Russia the benefit of the doubt that there was going to be a new Russia now, um, there wouldn't have been as much of a need for for an organization like that that potentially could threaten the security of Russia. Okay, so a lot of that you know, has a certain amount of credence. I, I, and, and any war and any type of situation like this is always a lot more complicated. Once you start peeling back all the different layers of what's going on, there's absolutely no, no doubt about that. I don't, I'm not here saying that there is a, a a good guy and a bad guy, so to speak. It's, it's not star Wars where you have, you know, the evil force and the good force. It's not that. And I'm not that much of a Star Wars fan. I don't know if that's an accurate way to analogize the storyline or not. But that's the best way I, I can illustrate it in simple terms. There's, a, there's times when both sides are a mix of greatness and very great flaws simultaneously. Where this situation now has come to a head for me is that regardless of how we got here, Regardless of what little magic got us here, okay, 
The bottom line is that there's horrible things happening now beyond the scope of a conventional war. There's mass graves. There's all these other things going on, stories of executions, people being kidnapped. And I know the critics of of this are going to say, well, that's how do we know that? Well, I don't know how many countries have intelligence forces and um, the people who are journalists following this. Let's just say there's a lot. It seems to be pretty unanimous. I, I sometimes follow what the BBC and a lot of times uh, follow uh, some of the media that's down in Australia, around the world. And, and it just seems like there, there's pretty much unanimous agreement that Russia is doing bad things. OK, and the only uh, the only stories of things happening that 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 counter that are coming from the same place. They're coming from Russia. So there comes a point when you have 50 versions of the truth here and one here, the, the, you know, your, your common sense has to sort of take over. So I believe it's very true that Russia is committing atrocities. They have a history of it. And when you start getting into things like this, when you are shooting at civilians who are running away, trying to get away from the fighting, when you have mass graves, when you have evidence that people have been executed and tortured, and some of the some of the time this has included children, women and children and other things, at that point you have to say to, say to yourself, nothing justifies this. I, I don't care what the, the stories are and what led to this and what led to that back in 1975. I, I don't care. Okay. This is now and nothing justifies this. If you really want to support Russia and say that they're okay in taking the Ukraine, that's fine, but you can take Ukraine without doing all these other things without the terror of of war and and savagery against the innocent people who had nothing to do with whatever you feel the wrongs were done to russia these people here that are laying in the middle of the street like bags of garbage to be collected at a later time these people had nothing to do with that And that's what's really wrong when you do these very overt, violent things like start a war. Is It's 90% of the time the wrong people get hurt. The wrong people are affected. So that's where a lot of these, these people on the right in particular, and I'm sure there's others on the far right. And here again, I'm only talking about a few, and I'm sure there's others of different ideological backgrounds. But this is where one of one of the areas where a lot of this is coming from. And a lot of this has credit. There's, a, there's absolutely no doubt about it. The other area that this is coming from is, again, this uh, support of a certain president. And I'm going to I'm going to preface this again, because I, I, I people always presume I'm going to take a side when it comes to ideology. And that very rarely happens. All right. Um. You know, there's there's something that bothers me, for example, about this Hunter Biden thing. If that was Donald Trump Jr., that's all Rachel Maddow would be talking about. Okay, and I'm not going to get into the details of that. If you follow politics enough, you know that there's there's a problem with Hunter Biden and some other things going on. All right. Now, if you're if you're stomping your feet and say, yeah, that's right, Billy, you're, you're absolutely right then I I want you to to take a quick listen to this. President Trump, you first. Um, Just now, President Putin denied having anything to do with the election interference in 2016. Every U.S. intelligence agency has concluded that Russia did. My first question for you, sir, is who do you believe? So I have great confidence in my intelligence people, but uh, I will tell you that President Putin was extremely strong and powerful in his denial today. All right, just as quick as I am to point out the hypocrisy of the mainstream media and the left when it comes to how they've been handling Hunter Biden versus how they would have handled it with Donald Trump Jr. I'm going to call out the same hypocrisy here. Now, if you listen to that answer, and actually I, I it's edited a little bit. He went into this whole thing about Hillary Clinton's emails 
and how President Putin offered uh, to have his people work with our people to find out what the truth was and all these other things. But at the end of the day, he called into question how much credence he gave our intelligence people versus a foreign leader. Now, if you can imagine Joe Biden doing that, that's all Sean Hannity would be talking about. If it had been President Obama, that's all these extreme right wingers would be talking about. And in terms of hypocrisy in this case, in regard to these extreme right wingers, is these are the very people you don't dare disrespect the flag. Okay, that you don't burn it, you stand up for it, you da 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 da. Because this flag represents people who have served our country and fought for our freedom. Yes, 100%. I agree with that. Okay? So where is that when we are talking about our intelligence forces, many of whom put their lives on the line to get that information? Many of whom in, in, the, in the intelligence community, if they get caught, we will never acknowledge that that person existed. They're just gone. That's the kind of scary world that that intelligence community often operates in. Okay. And that's, that's the same flag that represents these people. Now, it's one thing for a president to have doubts about some information and express that privately with the individuals involved. It's another thing to stand on a world stage and right next to a leader that had, at the very least has been a foe of us for a long time and to publicly call the service of those people into question to me is very troublesome. And I would be saying the same thing no matter who the president was. So let's, when it comes to these ideologically driven moral standards, I would be very careful. For my money, a given action should either be right or wrong in the context of its own terms. It doesn't matter who is doing it. It doesn't matter who it's being done to whether you like one versus the other. A given action is either right or wrong. And I, I always say it's a red flag. If you're talking to somebody about what's going on in Ukraine right now and their defense of Ukraine is 100% unilateral, they won't even consider another point about Russia and vice versa. You know, you have a Russia supporter and they won't even concede one thing about the Ukraine. That's a red flag. That's a red flag that these people that are having these discussions are in a bubble. And they're, they're a lot of times just defending the politicians that they like no matter what. And they're tearing up down the ones that they don't like no matter what. And it, it has not served us well. We have got to get out of these ideological bubbles. It is very, very important that we do so. All right. Speaking of ideological bubbles, we're going to talk about social media now. Now, there is a segue for you, right? Elon Musk, Twitter, all this other good stuff. Back in March, Elon Musk tweeted a poll to his followers and asked whether they believe Twitter was protecting free speech. And he said the results in which roughly 70% of 2 million respondents said no. Now, to be clear, the First Amendment applies to the government censoring free speech, but not to companies such as Twitter and so on. They may have their own rules of, about what can be put on the site. And, okay, that's fair enough. But to add more nuance to this, in my opinion, what we have now is a threat to free speech, not so much necessarily by direct action from the government, but by mob rule. And uh, a lot of this uh, cancel culture is, is, is a good example of that. You know, these mobs come out and they demand that advertisers stop advertising on someone's program or they put pressure on a certain platform to drop a certain person 
And this isn't really the way that this is all supposed to work. This is actually one of the failings of democratic ideals in general, in that the line between a democratic government, let's say, and mob rule is very thin. And what's happening now is we are having censorship by mob rule. So technically, you know, First Amendment wise and governmentally, it may or may not be a threat to free speech as we normally consider it in terms of what the government is doing. But we, the people, are allowing advertisers to be more or less extorted into stopping uh, their advertising on a certain program. Or we're, we're taking these platforms and threatening boycotts and everything unless they drop a certain artist or a certain person who's a, who's a commentator and so on. And this is really, to me, it is a threat to free speech. And this is multiplied by the fact that these platforms a lot of times have become so large and powerful, they drowned out everything else. And by default, they are becoming one of the key areas where free speech occurs. Okay. So this can kind of get a little bit more complicated than what it seems on the surface. Okay. Now, Musk offered $43 billion. That's a lot of money to purchase Twitter. And in the process, he was, he says that he is going to, first of all, unlock Twitter's potential. And I do believe that Twitter has a lot of potential. I've, I've always felt ve- very good about that platform. And it's more or less the social media platform that I'm, that I'm on the most. The Billy D's podcast, real easy to find on Twitter at Billy D's. And uh, prior to making this offer, Elon um, acquired a 9.2 stake in the company, but he didn't join the board. And that did fuel a lot of speculation because... Apparently, there's been rules about how much a board member can own of the company. Um, he claims that get it, going after Twitter and acquiring it is not a business investment. He's doing this because he just feels that Twitter has a lot of potential and it should be doing a lot of good in the community. And quite frankly, even if he doesn't get all of the company with what he owns already and with his power and influence, he probably could uh, affect a lot of positive change on Twitter without outright buying it. He does say that he would like an edit feature um, for the tweets, which a lot of people have been asking for. These would be time sensitive and they would zero out any retweets. I presume that means if you edit a tweet, it cannot be retweeted. Um, he's going to try to eliminate the bots as a top priority. And boy, that is that is an issue. A lot of these fake accounts and a lot of the things that go on there uh, really uh, interfere with the good and proper use of Twitter. He has also suggested one of the things that he would do is make the content moderation. Obviously, there has to be some rules, but he would make the content moderation more transparent in terms of what can fly and what can't. He would make it more noticeable for tweets being promoted or de-emphasized, whether they were being done so manually or algorithmically. Boy, I got that word out. I was lucky there. (laughs) He would very rarely ban an account. Uh, He would prefer suspensions, sometimes long suspensions, but outright banning forever would be very rare. Another thing he would make um, more transparent, which I find very curious, is the a- the actual coding structure of Twitter. Now, I, I, that doesn't necessarily mean open source, which I would definitely not be, I w- I'm not sure I'd want that. But he would make the coding, uh, the structure of it more transparent uh, so that people could make suggestions and that they would, could take in more account of of how they want the platform to work. Now, he says himself he doesn't necessarily have a strategy for how he himself, Elon Musk, uses Twitter. And that's something that you hear a lot about, different strategies for promoting yourself and things like that. He claims he doesn't have one, that his Twitter timeline is more of a stream of consciousness. And I find this very curious because whether it be SpaceX or Tesla, neither one of these companies actually have... Um, an advertising campaign, so to speak, or a social media campaign. So he's pretty much it. So it's uh, th- that's an interesting uh, point, something uh, 
that, you know, probably would be worth talking about for people who do social media marketing. So anyway, as it stands right now, I'm all for this. I am all for, I hope it happens, that Elon Musk uh, gets control of Twitter. And I believe it could be a good thing for social media in general. You know, every once in a while, it's, it's good to have somebody stir the pot. And we've had the same structures now in social media across the board. Any platform that you want to name, it seems like it's the same problems. It's the same issues. And it would be really cool to have somebody stir the pot. And in the long run, I believe that would be a good thing. And here again, these ideologies now, you know, so many people say they're going to leave Twitter if he gets control of it. And the other way around, people are going to come on just because he's involved in it. These are all the wrong reasons. Okay, you have to examine a platform. Does it work within a, a certain realm of fairness? Is it something that you feel will work for you? Is it something that you would like to participate in? These are the things that matter. And if you don't like it, that's fine. Then, then it's perfectly fine not to use it. And the other way around, if it's something that, that you really like, obviously, absolutely jump on it and, and perfect your skills and get on it. But to say that you will or won't use it simply because you don't like a particular person who's involved in it, this is where, you know, it's the same problems. We keep falling into the same, same traps. You know, I like this person, so I'll use their product. I don't like this person, so I won't. It's, you know, there's extreme examples of what some people have done and, and whether or not you're, you're going to support them. That's different. But for the most part. Let's take Zuckerberg, for example. I haven't been a fan of his for a long time. But I also know that, especially in my world, which is marketing and all these other things, Facebook is a part of that. And Facebook does some things from a, a social media marketing strategy standpoint very well. It does other things very poorly. But I stay within those confines. I operate within those confines and I use it as needed or don't use it as needed. And, and that's pretty much it. Um, I, I, I'm very much an advocate for analyzing the world around you on a practical level, on a logical level and taking ideology and likes and dislikes and all these other things, how we let our likes and dislikes govern our moral compass. And that's probably the biggest one. You know, just like with the cancel culture, as far as I'm concerned, if someone's on the radio or what have you, the ratings should do the work. And in the business world, the, the products that people are producing, are, are they quality products? And, and, and the marketplace from that aspect should do the work. We should not be gathering, you know, these mobs to make judgments and, 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 and affect change from that aspect. So that to me is where free speech really needs to be. You know, out of the scope of the governmental overreach, which is a, another topic, but so many technological means now exist that are far beyond what was ever imagined during the times of how the, the rules of free speech were put together. So we have to take this in, in, in that context. And for the most part, sometimes the unpleasant things, the things that we don't like are the things that we need to hear. And that's why free speech and the free market in general, to me anyway, is so important. I'm Billy Dees. I certainly hope you enjoyed this episode. We have some great interviews coming up for you. And we also have uh, some episodes coming up where we're going to continue to talk about current events, including the Ukraine. And I will have some co-hosts on the program to share their opinions as well. And that's all coming up in the coming weeks. I'm Billy Dees. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter, as I mentioned before, at Billy D's. That's kind of my social media home. And until next week, we'll be talking to you soon. Thank you for listening. Well, hello, everyone. I am Billy D's from the self-titled Billy D's podcast. You can find me on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and many more of the best podcast networks. Join me for my commentary and interviews. Follow me on Twitter, really easy to find, at Billy D's. I am Billy D's. I'd love to have you listen in. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. 
Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. Hello, saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC.